blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God, 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This week, I came across an article about the psychological causes of racism. And that led me down a lot of rabbit trails as I tried to avoid writing this sermon. <laughs> I found a lot of studies on the relationship between human psychology and the effort to determine how our anthropology and our psychology and our choices intermix to make racist and discriminatory decisions that sometimes separate us from each other. Now I'm no expert and there were many expert opinions in these articles and they were very difficult to sort out but one article in particular caught my eye. Psychologist Steve Taylor suggested that there is a sort of psychological descent into t racism that has five steps. The first condition he outlines that sends us into the spiral towards racism is what he calls the psychological theory of terror management. When confronted with our mortality or with scarcity or with any other perceived threat to our well-being, we can become anxious and insecure. One defensive response to that can be to cling to group identities, national or ethnic ones, or others, as a way to strengthen our sense of belonging, to relieve us from that threat. Taylor suggested that by itself, this is not a bad thing, and in many ways we come to church to achieve that sense of belonging, to, to claim a group identity and, and to relieve existential identity, uh, anxiety, for example. Or some may belong to a tribe of Chargers fans or anti-Chargers fans. <laughs> Finding a sense of group identity is not bad. But he says that the second level in this spiral towards racism can occur when that group identity takes a turn placing anger or aggression against other groups. 
when the group identity finds its cohesion by defining itself against the other, they've plunged into the second level of the spiral. The third and fourth levels of this process are related. The next stage is to lose empathy for those in the outside group while retaining empathy with those in the group. And he points out that Hitler, for example, was known for his ability to be kind to the people around him. And so the fourth level then is to take that lack of empathy for outsiders even further and categorize all outsiders in one standard way to dehumanize them or de-individualize them. And the outsiders are then seen only through the lens of the stereotype and the prejudice. And so finally, at the lowest level of this spiral, these uh, people might project their own flaws and challenges onto the outside group, their own flaws and challenges. So outsiders then become scapegoats for any problem, often resulting in violence. And Taylor notes that those with narcissistic and paranoid personality traits are especially prone to this behavior because they're unable to reflect on their own faults and more likely to push them outwards onto others. I really appreciated Taylor's model, while at the same time wondered about how it might help us reflect on systemic and institutional racism. Individual racism is an over oversimplification of racism that somehow reinforces the idea that racism is just an individual behavior. It's not. Racism is embedded into the very fabric of the culture we live in, and it requires an active resistance from all of us if we want to change it. American culture values European Anglo habits and practices not just skin color, in explicit and subtle ways. From our emphasis on individualism to our assumption that someone must be blamed if there's something going wrong, to our belief that more is better. We have a culture that's distinctively white, and it's hard to evaluate it while we're living in the middle of it. Jen Zhao and I just spent a few months trained to be trainers in a new diocesan anti-racism training called Visions. And at least for me, it was challenging to be asked to look at our culture in a way that's honest, that doesn't diminish what I value, but also acknowledges that our U.S. culture doesn't make room for other ways and values and belief systems and that that can filter down to all of our institutions, including our churches, too. It's hard work. I learned from that training that it won't do simply to speak up when a wall is being built if we really want to tackle racism at its core, although certainly a wall built on the argument that brown people are criminal is racist and must be resisted. That seems especially poignant after yesterday's incident with pro-wall youth interrupting a Native American demonstration, trying to intimidate them with mob rule. It's saddening, it's maddening, and it feels powerless in some ways. But there is a relationship between the spiral Taylor described and systemic and institutional racism. As they say in the visions training, some racism is caught and some is taught. And it takes a lot of self-examination to determine which is which. At the root of it all is the desire to belong. It's rooted in existential angst 
as Taylor suggested. Sometimes that just gets expressed in horrible ways. But that brings us to the gospel story today, the wedding at Cana. And this is the first sign in the gospel of John. It's the only sign or miracle in all of the gospels that does not involve a healing or an exorcism. It's the only one where somebody's life is not at stake. In this story, we have Jesus, who, by the way, was a partier. I hope you know that. John the Baptist was the ascetic, but Jesus was an eat, drink, and be merry kind of guy. He liked to have fun and enjoy the people around him. So Jesus, in this story, needs a little prompting from his mother to get going. But once he does, he takes this abundance of water. Our, inter- our translation says 30 wall- waters per uh, container, but most scholars say it's more like 180 gallons in total. That's something like a milk jug for everybody in here. It's a lot of wine. <laughs> and it's not the two buck chuck. <laughs> this is the good stuff. It's such good wine that the steward wonders why they didn't bring this stuff out first when the guests were sober enough to tell the difference. In that day, the hospitality was a little more serious of an affair than it is for us. A wedding party was planned to last several days without grocery stores and food marts running out of food or drink. It was a big deal. The guests depended on the host for their needs, and not to be able to provide would bring shame on the host. So here's the thing. Jesus performs the sign in the gospel not because somebody needs it to heal or to be freed from demons. Jesus creates this abundant wine, showing his, uh, revealing his identity as the Messiah, so that this party can go on, so that there is no outsider. Jesus makes an abundance of wine, 180 gallons of wine, simply to bring joy to a group of people, so that there won't be an outsider, so that there won't be shame, so that the party can go on and everybody can belong, and there won't be shame, and and joy can be the outcome. The abundance of the wine is a sign that God's abundance is a gift. It's not to be hoarded. God's abundance, when turned inwards, can become greed and scarcity. The host at the party didn't say, hmm, I better take all that up and store it for a rainy day. Instead, God's abundance is meant to be shared at a party for everybody. Nobody has to go home early at God's party. God's abundance isn't there for our individual needs alone, though. God's abundance exists to pull us towards each other, to turn us from the human race into the human family. God's abundance changes us from strangers into community. And when that happens, we're taken care of individually as well. It's not that we can't or we shouldn't save stuff. It's that abundance is a call to generosity. And generosity leads to relationship. And relationship can lead to joy. And abundance, generosity, and joy, they're all so closely related. Recognizing abundance and sharing it with others and and finding joy in the relationships that are renewed. It's a grace to be celebrated. It's a party. It's a feast. It's something we do every week right here at this table.
So as we sit here on this 90th birthday weekend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in his words, if you are seeking the highest good, I think you can find it through love. I wonder if we can find the abundance of God that calls this, this whole human family out of fear, out of scarcity, and turns it into a party of love where the wine flows freely and there is abundant joy, where difference is embraced, black and white, gay and straight, man and woman, cis and trans, all are welcome. And the host says, come in. There is plenty. You belong. Where people meet as strangers, but leave as friends. Where laughter is a sacrament, and stories can be overheard, and there are no outsiders. In just a minute, we're going to have a party at that table. And I invite you to come and taste and see and be refreshed and carry the party out into the world. Because everyone is welcome in the abundance of God's love.
us pray for the church and for the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly be a humbly serve you. Let your name be glorified. Thank you. 
My name is Penny Bridges. I serve as the Dean or Senior Pastor of St. Paul's Cathedral. And it's my joy to welcome you this morning, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself in the journey of faith. Please know that you are most welcome to participate in all that we do here at St. Paul's. God's table is open to everyone. And at communion time, if you wish to receive the sacrament, as you come forward, just put your hands together, one on top of the other. If you prefer to receive a blessing, cross your hands at your shoulders. And if you require a gluten-free wafer, they'll be available over here near the healing station in the Guadalupe. If you're visiting with us this morning, a special welcome to you. I hope you'll stop by the the, uh, welcome table right outside the door in the courtyard after the service and tell us a little about yourself and pick up a gift to remind you to come back again and see us soon. If you're celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week, I invite you to stand as I say a prayer for you. Birthday for Claire, birthday, lots of birthdays. Anyone behind me? Okay, let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many happy returns to you all. I want to draw your attention to our Cathedral Life leaflet. It has details of many of our activities. In particular, let me just mention the new Bible class that's starting on Wednesday evening and running for six or seven weeks. It's Bible Basics, so um, come and uh, see how much you already know, and maybe you'll learn something new. We'll we'll gather for dinner, a simple dinner at six, and then continue with the class. On Saturday, we have one of our sesquicentennial events, a tour um, of one of the oldest churches, Episcopal churches in California, Um, and wine tasting and lunch. Um, So please sign up today for that. We need to know how many people are coming so we know what size bus to to, um, rent. And I hope there'll be a large group that will enjoy that that very relaxing day. Next Sunday is our annual congregational meeting um, in this, our 150th year. And uh, we will um, celebrate and hear reports and we'll have, um, we'll have chapter elections. Will those people who are, those chapter nominees who are present please stand so that we can get a look at you. There's Margaret, and there's Bob, and there's Donna, and there's Jairus in the back by the pillar. And I thank you all for being willing to stand for election. Yeah. At that meeting, we'll have another important piece of business, and that is a proposed change to our bylaws. The details are posted um, on the walls in the porches and around the campus, but essentially it's calling for, um, for chapter members to uh, be allowed to um, stand for re-election at the end of one full term, um, so they can do two consecutive terms. So please um, look at the details and um, come on Sunday ready to discuss and to vote on that. That happens, by the way, that meeting happens at noon. Right after this service, there will be a, a wonderful lunch, and then um, we'll, we'll continue on with the, with the annual meeting. Um, another really important event that's coming up is a week from tomorrow. Our building project is coming before this full city council, and it's in the afternoon of January 28th at City Hall. And just like in November, we need lots of people to come out and show your support. Um, There are some um, half-sheet save-the-date notes for you to pick up in the porches. I think the ushers will be handing them to you on your way out. And there'll be an email coming out early in the week with more detailed instructions. But if you don't get our emails or you prefer to be on paper, um, this is what the the save-the-date thing looks like. Um, There are also full-sheet copies of the instructions in the porches. So... Please look for those, and uh, we'll gather for carpooling from the cathedral at 1.10 on the 28th, Monday the 28th, or you can just meet us at City Hall, but please do come and or write a letter of support. Um, it really does make a difference. Please stand as you're able. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Paul, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say,
Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time or ever before. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come not because the church invites you. It is Christ and he invites you to meet him here. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Joanna, in the name of this congregation, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that Bjorn Markison may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body because we all share one cup and one bread. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. serve the Lord.